How's everybody doing today? That is pretty apathetic, okay? <laughs> All right, that's our topic today, apathy and burnout. But before we get there, let me give you a few announcements that'll jazz you up. All right, so uh, the right uh, place. You, you know, when you see counselors at the table, get nervous. All right, so uh, um, just a quick note on some of the things that are coming up from the center. On March 26th, we have a faith and work conference called Equipped. Uh, as you all know, classes have been canceled for that day so that you're free to attend. If you want to register, that's dts.edu slash faith and work. Students get a discounted rate to the conference. Um, Tim Keller and Tom Nelson are going to be our main speakers during the day. You are more than welcome. We've canceled classes so that you have an excuse to come. And so don't be apathetic about coming to the equipped conference. Uh, and then our second announcement is, if you are interested in an internship with the Hendricks Center, please contact us. Uh, we have all kinds of internships in all kinds of categories, uh, and, uh, and it's a real uh, opportunity to see what we do uh, up close on a regular basis. So please feel free to contact anyone on the internship staff. We've got the um, display deck back there in the back. You can visit there if you're interested in an internship. We'd love to have you uh, be a part of that with us if you're looking to do that. And then the third announcement is, as we proceed through the cultural engagement chapel, you can see there are <coughs> microphones where you can step up and ask questions. But we also have a text uh, ability to text your question in that I'll be collecting up here. And after I'm done with the initial interview, uh, we will uh, take those uh, questions, whether you're standing or texting and uh, and hopefully help you get through our topic. Our topic today is apathy and burnout and my guests are Kelly Cheatham who is director of counseling services here at the at the seminary, correct? Yes, right, that's right. And you're going to be honored at the end of this year for your fifth year of service here at the seminary, that's is that right. right? September. So congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and then, yeah. <laughs> And then we've got Andy Thack Thacker, who is in the counseling department here, and she's going to help us as well. So I'm just going to dive right in. Okay. So how does one become an expert in apathy, and who cares? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, when I think of being an expert in apathy, I cringe a little bit because I don't want to necessarily claim that I'm an expert in apathy okay. or burnout because okay. I want to have a, uh, I want to maintain that respect for the poss for the f fact that we're all susceptible to burnout and apathy. So um, if I said I'm an expert in a burnout and apathy, then it tends to make me be less likely to actually fall into that or more likely to actually fall into that. So, oh, interesting. Um, but I guess to know more about apathy and, and burnout, there's this, you know, part of just living uh, the life that we live and the experiences we have and to um, to learn from those things and be able to talk about them. So, so um, let, let's talk a little bit about the training that you all get to, that prepares you to be in a position to help mm -hmm. students who find themselves in this position. Um, what's, in, what's involved, Andy, what's involved in, in getting a degree? I mean, I know you go poor, but beyond that, what's, what's, <laughs> involved, what, what, what's, involved, what's involved in getting a counseling degree? Well, Kelly and I both have our masters from okay. DTS, and we also both have our doctorates from UNT. And at, at DTS, we were required to do 20 personal sessions of counseling. And all counseling, not all counseling students, most counseling students tend to think, I don't really need this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be a counselor. I'm good. <laughs> and that is part of the beginning of the journey of knowing yourself as a counselor. Mm and beginning to self-reflect so that you are helpful to other people. And that's one of the first stepping stones. And then there's a lot of uh, internship time or experience mm -hmm. time. What, what, what's that? That's a state requirement, isn't it? It is. We are required as counselors to do so many semesters and so many hours working with actual clients before we graduate. And then after graduation, we have to complete 3,000 supervised hours with clients. I think I heard the number 3,000, is that right? I did. Yeah, mm -hmm. wow. Okay, so 
So that's a lot of how long have you been feeling like this questions, right? <laughs> it is. It's a long time walking around the same mountain. Yeah, right. Exactly. Walking around the same mountain. You know, I've never thought about comparing Joshua to counselors. But anyway, so um, so, so this, this training that you get when you're a student is supervised? Is it, is it mentored, structured? How exactly does that work? Mm -hmm. Well, our students go on site at actual practices and clinics, and they see clients, and then they record those sessions and bring them back to class, and we watch them and pick it apart. Oh, so it's like the preaching sessions. It is. Similar. Yeah, yeah. Similar, very, very similar. similar. Interesting. Um, okay, Kelly, so, so the next question is obviously, I'm actually going to ask you both of these. How did you get into this gig to begin with? I mean, wh mm, what, wow. what drew you into counseling? <clears throat> Well, I think like a lot of people, I had just more of a first, just a general draw to ministry, mm -hmm. um, which that's a long story. But uh, certain life events occurred, and I knew that I wanted to serve in some capacity. So um, that was put on my heart first. And then I had involved with other men and <clears throat> who started encouraging me to consider consider counseling as a an option. And as, as soon as I kind of started digging into it, if you will. I knew this is the right place for me. So I would say I got into it based on, you know, of course, God putting that in my heart and, and then some type, you know, gradual revelation of counseling specifically. So did you come into the counseling program or did you switch from a THM into a counseling? I really came into the counseling program. Mm -hmm. I seriously thought about the THM first. My pastor encouraged that. But once I learned more about it, I realized that... Um, you know, really, the MABC was the best thing for me. Hmm. And my wife had something to say about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she wanted me to, to do what I could do and, you know, not necessarily, you know, really just focus on being a counselor. And that's, that's been a good And thing. Andy, how did you end up in this mm. line of ministry? Well, all of us in this line of ministry are somewhat trying to fix our families and ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's part of my story is mm -hmm. that seeing brokenness in my own family and wanting to minister to others who are broken. Um, so just kind of a real passion for the hurting and those who are lost in their own stuff. And um, I think the Lord really bends us certain ways, and my temperament and my bent is very much as a counselor. Hmm. So um, let, me, let me, before we get specifically into apathy and burnout and those kinds of things, let me, let me deal with a general question about counseling, because I think Going to counseling, uh, I mean, it, it, it's a hurdle for some people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, talk a little bit about that, just the hurdle of, of the actual choice to go into counseling and the way in which um, counseling is designed to be done in a way that actually is very protective of the person who seeks it out. So, mm -hmm. Kelly? Um, sure, there is a stigma involved mm -hmm. with counseling. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's better than it used to be, but mm -hmm. there's still that still remains, especially in certain cultures. So um, it really is obviously a personal decision about going, and sometimes there's just a lack of uh, maybe an ignorance about the benefit of counseling and what counseling is and what it isn't. But um, <clears throat> so there certainly there's a, lot, a need for many people to come that don't. I, I I guess I'm biased, but I feel like everyone could benefit from counseling. <laughs> um, so it, it's not um, there's not a whole lot of really, frankly, a lot of public awareness or education about that. Un unfortunately, I wish there was, and I, like I said, I think there is a trend towards people realizing more that counseling is. You don't have to be um, quote unquote sick to go to counseling. You just need to realize there may be some things you want to change and you want to work on and but again there's an ignorance about what is it actually what's going to happen so it takes humility it takes vulnerability and those those are things that are hard to sometimes to be willing to to do so um <clears throat> but there is a i'll let maybe andy speak to this too but there is certainly part of our ethics as as counselors is to protect the uh, privacy of what happens in the counseling process. So, and again, that's something that people don't necessarily know. So how strong is that? Because I do think it's important for people to realize how, how important um, the privacy aspect of counseling is. We are ethically and legally bound to keep the things that our clients tell us confidential. There are some limits to confidentiality if someone has been hurt by uh, another person, if they're a minor. If 
they were a minor when they were hurt, if they're going to hurt themselves, we have to break confidentiality for those things, but we do it very carefully. But other than that, we keep everything in confidence, and our licenses are on the line if we don't. Hmm. So let's let's talk about um, burnout and and apathy. Distinguish them for us. Which I mean, are they related or what's, how would how would how should we think about these kinds of categories? Hmm. I think burnout comes before apathy. Okay, mm -hmm. and. Burnout is, I, I have a mental image of just kind of like running out of gas and just slowly coasting. If you've ever done that, hypothetically on 635. <laughs> <laughs> hypothetically. I haven't, but oh, I've, you heard, heard, oh, you've heard. I've heard. Yeah, you've gone by many people who've had yes, that happen to yes. them. Yes. And yes. your sympathy as a counselor just pours yes, out to them as you pass out. them. Yeah. That must be horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just a slow fizzle that there's nothing left that's going to inch you forward mm -hmm. and then ap apathy I think of is you just have your care meter is done mm -hmm. it's broken mm -hmm. and um, this is a problem not just for students but it, it can happen in the pastorate as well in the context mm -hmm. of ministry absolutely uh, um, I the, actually uh, the man who mentored me and I did my internship under and as a student went through this pretty severely um, in the middle of a pastor I remember visiting with him and he said this is the metaphor that he used. One thing about pastors is they have a way of picturing what they're going through. He says, I feel like a Coke machine that people put, keep putting mm -hmm. money in, but there are no Cokes in the machine. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting yeah. mm -hmm. image. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so and, and, and you get there sometimes so slowly, you don't even notice it until right. it happens. Is that mm -hmm. kind of the way it falls down absolutely that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier this uh, need to be aware of us being susceptible and realizing that it can sneak up on you so to speak so uh, maintaining certain maybe we're going to talk about this in a minute but maintaining certain choices in life and, mm -hmm. and when it comes to different types of, of health um, obviously is important so we want to be more in tune with preventing burnout and, and the apathy that comes with it um, versus trying to respond to it after it happens. So we need to be, realize that, that can, it can happen to any of us, regardless, in ma many fields for that matter, but maybe in, in ministry and in seminary uh, as much as any of them. So. Because if someone is constantly on call to serve, that, that can be emotionally draining. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so let's, let's talk a little about what are some of the signs that you might be there or approaching it or, you know, what, 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 what's on the radar screen that you should pay attention to? Well, the body is always the thing that speaks first. Unfortunately, we tend to fly right past that. Mm -hmm. But any signs of fatigue, sleep is one of the most important things mm -hmm. that we have to engage in. And it's a constant reminder because we have to sleep that we are not God. Mm -hmm. And so if, if someone is exhausted, that's a great sign that they are headed towards burnout, if not already there. Okay, so I can I can sense that there could be some students out there who say, I'm taking you know so many hours, mm -hmm. I'm working so many mm -hmm. jobs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What kind of what kind of sleep guidelines would you give to someone in terms of their pace of their life and that kind of thing? Is there is there kind of a baseline uh, as far as the number of hours? Yeah, and things like that? yeah. There's all kinds of studies about that, and some people will say that they don't need as much as anyone else and as other people necessarily. Um, so there's no real hard, and f that, that, of course, the number's always been eight, mm -hmm. eight hours a night. Mm -hmm. Some studies show you don't need, as, need that much, but it's not just the number of hours, but it's, you have to maybe adjust your sleep based on the stress you're under. Mm -hmm. And ironically, the more stressed you are, the more difficult it is to actually sleep. So there can be a cycle that starts. Mm -hmm. um, so we, but again, being aware of that tendency and we all have a limitation of what we can do. So, so much of, of, to me, of the burnout and, and the ap apathy that comes with it is, is an energy issue mm -hmm. and realizing we only have so much energy, so much time, so much energy to give. And if we're trying to kind of cheat that and think we can get away with not uh, getting enough sleep, for example, then that will have, it'll have consequences that'll sneak up on us. It's one of the indicator. Can one of the indicators be having difficulty sleeping yes. because you're so mm -hmm. right. wound up mm -hmm. that you can't mm -hmm. actually, you know, put your head on the pillow and 
and go right. to sleep. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, indicators like, you know, uh, depression, mm -hmm. which also comes from a lack of sleep. And mm -hmm. so these things work together. Um, stress, of course. Um, lack of motivation, which is really the uh, apathy. Those are all signs of, of someone who's really kind of pushing the envelope and getting close to that burnout point. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think can happen is, is that you can get uh, I'm, I'm going to use the word distracted, probably not the best word, but you can get distracted in terms of the equilibrium between the sense of pressure and stress that you feel, that kind of thing, versus remembering, you know, why you're doing what you're doing in ministry and the, mm -hmm. and the balance between those two things. What advice do you all have about, about that combination of, of, of factors? Well, you're speaking to the motivation for why someone is in ministry, and I a lot of us go into ministry because we love the Lord and we love people. There's also other motivating factors that impact that. And sometimes those factors keep us distracted and we, we run ourselves into the ground because we're trying to do things like earn our worthiness or please other people. And so I think that's a big distracting factor. The approval part of, of mm -hmm. getting our identity from the affirmation that can come from wearing yourself out mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, so um, so let's talk about how do you begin to avoid um, avoid falling into this what are some of the things that you can do that can help you to either catch yourself or or deal with with the issue of apathy and, and burnout mm -hmm. oh go ahead Kelly um, this isn't probably uh, breaking news, but of course, uh, <laughs> maintaining a good prayer life mm -hmm. and, and keeping staying in the Word and, and just maintaining that relationship with, with God. So make, you know, keeping things in the right priority and order, of course, is important. Um, that's something that we, oh, of course I'm going to do that, but then maybe we're, we're not really doing that. So mm -hmm. we need to look at what's going on there and, and how is our relationship with the Lord during all this. So that's first and foremost. Um, um, and then relationship with other people too. What are we isolating ourselves? We will sometimes tend to isolate ourselves even from our family and friends, and, and uh, you know we need to, you know we're buckling down that kind of thing. But we're we don't have anybody there really to give us some maybe some feedback, accountability. Of, hey, you know you're maybe you're pushing yourself too hard here. So we we do have a blind spot sometimes within ourselves about about what we are able to do and what we're not able to do. So. You know, that raised a question in my head. And is there a difference in the experience for someone who's single versus someone who's married, or is it the same? Are the dynamics the same? We were just talking about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think oftentimes we tend to give people who are married and maybe have children more of a pass because they might have more factors. And that's not really fair because people who are single have just as many mm -hmm. challenges as people who are married. I know when I was going through seminary, my husband worked, so that alleviated a huge load off of me. Mm. And people who are single may not have that. They may not have a supportive family, and they may not have that partner at home who's saying, you got this, you can do this. So it, it may be more isolative, more lonely for someone who isn't married or have a significant other. And it's in some ways it's, it can be easier to um, to withdraw and stay mm -hmm. disconnected, mm -hmm. whereas mm -hmm. in the context of a family that I, that can <clears throat> inject the stress of being responsible for other people on the one hand, but on the other there will be people who will be aware of what's going on, mm -hmm. yeah. more likely to be aware of what's going on. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'll just remind you we've got microphones up here, and I'll be transitioning here to questions pretty soon, and then we're also texting. Uh, we've got a good list of questions here, so let me let me ask uh, let me ask this question: What is uh, and and there may be more than one, but what is one thing that students tend to do that they shouldn't do that sets them up for for this? What do you what do you commonly see as people come in and talk to you about this? Um, I think probably the number one thing is issues about boundaries, about not saying no saying yes to too many things, mm -hmm. you know, and that happens in ministry too. Um, so again, I keep, I guess I keep harping on this, but rec recognizing we only have so much time and energy to give and we are stewards of that and we are responsible for that. No one's going to do it for us. So we need to recognize, Hey, I, maybe I need to say no to some good things, um, for my own health. Um, so that's one thing is just being able to say no to 
We have a lot of good opportunities, and it's hard to say no sometimes. Yeah. So if someone uh, takes advantage of the opportunity to come in for counseling on this because they sense that something is amiss, mm -hmm. um, what are, what what can they expect? Mm. Well, if I was going to sit down with someone dealing with this issue, I would start with Tier 1 issues and then Tier 2 issues. Tier 1 issues are the basics of scheduling. It's like a budget. You have so much energy. You have so much time. How are you going to use it? Let's make sure we're not overextending the bank account. And then Tier 2 is what motivates you to not say no or to push through and to deal with kind of the underlying heart change issues. Hmm. What do you... Similar? I agree. Yeah. yeah. Breaking it down that way, realizing there's these, you know, behavioral choices we make, but then there's underlying things that are fueling those choices. And so we, so to just to tell someone, okay, quit saying no, or start saying no. <laughs> <laughs> Freudian slip. There. Yes. Um, then, uh, you know, that's, that's very, that's, that's almost even in caring and, and validating mm -hmm. for someone to realize mm -hmm. that's not that easy for me. So mm -hmm. what, what's deeper than that? What's the tier two thing there? So that's where counseling the process of counseling over time can really dig into that. And what does it take? Uh, what does it take on, on campus to seek this out? If you were to decide you needed to do that, just come to your office. Yes, absolutely. You can go to the students.dts.edu and counseling services and schedule an appointment right there online, or you can call or email. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me take a look at what what we've got here on the text. Um, <laughs> Everyone at DTS knows that in the third year of the THM, okay, uh, a student's eyes glaze over and they go into a funk. Um, this is obviously asked by an optimist. Um, <laughs> it, it, is that just inevitable and we accept it or is it avoidable and preventable and if so, how? Is there danger in that funk? Mm. Yeah, there's definitely danger in that. <laughs> exactly. Yes. I think in some ways it's avoidable and then in some ways it's always going to be inevitable that we're not going to do this perfectly mm -hmm. and it's practicing i mean we're practicing as counselors that means we haven't nailed this yet mm -hmm. and we're all practicing self-care and so when you see that you don't do a great job of it you learn from that and you course correct and and the counselor is there to kind of be supportive in the midst mm -hmm. of that process and and mm -hmm. to help you Perhaps in some cases, see things that you might not see otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I, I, that three thousand hours, three thousand hours number has really got me. <laughs> um, I, I take it that it, it really is um, a study in learning how to listen well and how to um, how to how to hear both what people say and what they are <laughs> not mm -hmm. saying. Can mm -hmm. we talk a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. uh, and what? Uh, we, there's what gets said, but you're looking at more than that, aren't you? Yeah, you you are um, engaging in a conversation or in a, in a process in such a way that you are trying to help them to realize these things about themselves, things that are maybe things they're wanting to change and, and how how all this fits together in their life. But you do, like I said earlier, we uh, as counselors can, like anyone could do for me too, I have blind spots. And so we all have the, this idea that we have a, a things that we don't see in ourselves. We're too close to the forest, so to speak. So counseling can certainly help that. So it might be that you are noticing patterns, for example, as they've shared things and you're able to point things, some things out and you're able to say, I'm hearing this, that you're wanting to do this, but I'm also seeing this. How do these things fit together? And maybe they have some of these light bulb moments. Well, yeah, you know, actually, I hadn't looked at it that way. Hmm. So those kinds of things, that's just part of what we do. But it's really kind of bringing things into their awareness. But then it doesn't end there. Then it's, well, what do we do about it? Yeah. Okay. Here's a question. For those who are or will be serving in a rural or small town ministry, what are some good resources or recommendations for equipping oneself for ministry and for receiving counseling oneself? I think some of the relationships you make in seminary can be most helpful in that area. My husband and I have dear friends who have come through DTS and they've gone out and they're pastors in rural areas and they maintain connection with us and we maintain connection with them to be an extra area of benefit because they may know everyone in the town or everyone in the town may know them and may not be able to handle them saying, hey, I really just don't care about people talking to me right now. Mm -hmm. 
and their their church people can't handle that, but mm-hmm. their good friends can, and know that they can offer support and be a little removed from the situation. So how 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 do how do you gauge how do you gauge when you're on the edge that because um, I I'm very aware of people who do get to the point of saying I'm spent I'm not sure I have anything to give if someone comes to me I'm doing the best that I can but I know I'm not really mm-hmm. helping them or me mm-hmm. um, what <clears throat> what's what's the advice in terms of taking a step back. Well, I think it's kind of like Andy said earlier, we need to look at what, what maybe is motivating them. And what if they do, first of all, there's a choice or, or again, a recognition that maybe they need to take a step back. If they're in mm-hmm. that position, then obviously they need to, you know, to slow down at least. And um, if, okay, but that's difficult for me. Okay, let's talk about why that is. If you took a step back, what would that mean for you? What are, what are the consequences of that? You know, we can talk about how maybe you'd have more rest and you'd maybe start feeling better, but... What is it you're giving up and what is it that makes that hard for you to do so really again through the process of counseling digging into those things and um, but I guess it would be again when they get to that point uh, sometimes it's it takes someone there to uh, for lack of a better word confront them about I'm, I'm concerned about you I see that you are on the edge and if they don't see it themselves and then, well, let's, you're not, you don't have, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. You're not the first person to be on the edge. Mm-hmm. So there, there's things we can do here to help you. And that's the good news. You know, we're not having to make this up as we go. And examining motivation, I imagine, is pretty important. And this is why the walk with God piece is so important as well, because yeah. it, it, it keeps you properly oriented to what it is that you're doing and why it is that you're doing it. Mm-hmm. I can speak to that personally. I've had many, I've said this many times in practical classes that, um, I've had those days where I go home as a counselor going, why do I do this? <laughs> Just tired and everything else at the end of the day. And then, you know, faithfully God will come along and, and I'll have a situation where I go, okay, and now I remember why I do this. Mm-hmm. So um, it's something that happens to all of us. Uh, it's just part of working with people. Um, so, you know, it's, but it may seem like we're in the desert a long time and we're not getting that reminder and we're not having, we're not seeing the, the fruit or we're not finding, um, you know, any motivation anymore. So that's all the more reason to slow down. Yeah. Lynn? And now we'll go, go okay. ahead. Well, <clears throat> one of the things that's helped me a lot in my um, numerous years of dealing with mental illness is being able to take lots and lots of drugs. So, uh, (laughs) and, you know, in the the spirit of Acts 2, I'm willing to share, you know, hold in common all the drugs that we have. But, uh, (laughs) you know, in whatever pastoral care or counseling I do, Mm -hmm. I always ask them to consider Mm -hmm. going to a therapist so I don't ever Mm -hmm. try to play that. But I will ask, about somewhere along the counseling, I'll ask about have they considered medicine mm-hmm. as an additional help, an adjunct to mm-hmm. therapy, not as a replacement to therapy. Right. But I'll also I'll often hear uh, anxiety, uh, fear about whether they're going to become addictive or whether they're going to create some kind of dysfunction. So, how, what would you have to say? about the role of meds. Mm. Well, I'm very much pro-meds, and I know Kelly is as well. Mm. I think that is a real fear that people have, and validating that fear and validating that concern, and then also talking about how God chooses certain means in modern day to bring healing and bring restoration, and medication is a part of that. And I know that's not the advice that all religious institutions believe. And so I've worked with lots of individuals who come in and they have, they already have a narrative behind medication because they've heard from someone who's well-meaning in the Christian community that it's not appropriate. But it really is appropriate. If, if we're willing to take medicine for diabetes and thyroid issues and cancer, why would we separate out psych- psychological meds? It just, you can't separate the body in that way. And so I'm very much 
pro medication and will encourage them collaboratively with their medical professional to find what would help them. And is it the case that if you're under stress and, and your body is under stress that you're, you, have, you may have chemically mm -hmm. messed up your system, if you say it that way. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes what these meds do is give your body a chance to get back into, mm -hmm. into balance. Right. Isn't, that, isn't that what's really trying to go on here? Yeah, that's definitely one way to look at it, and, and often it is and just a, um, the medication is something just to do temporarily uh, to kind of get them started, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, so that's another kind of a uh, confusion people have that once I start taking these meds, I'll always have to take them, mm -hmm. and often it's just something to help us through. And it, it does need to be in collaboration with therapy, uh, bias there too, but... Um, but there are most good, I feel like most good doctors, all the doctors I've ever collaborated with, um, they will only prescribe medicine with the mm -hmm. um, understanding that, the, that their patient is going to also be doing counseling. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, because if you're wound up in your stress, mm -hmm. you can't sleep, mm -hmm. have something that kind of winds you down so mm -hmm. that your body can collect itself mm -hmm. is... is a helpful thing. There are people that are so depressed that they literally can't get out of bed. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to come to counseling mm -hmm. or be, or fun, they're not functioning. Mm -hmm. So obviously mm -hmm. they need extra help there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what, what, uh, Lynn alluded to this. Um, what advice would you give to pastors to know when do I pastorally counsel and when do I hand someone off to someone who might be better equipped to deal with what it is that I'm hearing? Mm -hmm. I think any time there is a diagnosed mental illness, any time someone comes in with any type of suicidal ideation or homicidal ideation or psychosis, that's definitely something that needs to be addressed by a professional. I really think it works great collaboratively, where you have the pastor that is caring for the individual spiritually and emotionally, but also having a mental health professional work on the other stuff because pastors can do things that I can't do as a professional. I'm mm -hmm. not gonna see them on Sunday at church and mm -hmm. sit by them. I'm not gonna go do a home visit. That's out of my realm of, of ethical boundaries, mm -hmm. but pastors certainly can. So I think to think not, um, not a either or, but a both and. Mm -hmm. okay. um, how would you advise us to create a culture or talk about counseling? in a way that is supportive and so that when we have to have those conversations about mm -hmm. encouraging people towards that, that it's not a threat, it's an encouragement. Mm -hmm. Well, um, <clears throat> that's a great question. Mm -hmm. You know, what we, one thing I'm thinking, one first thing that pops to mind is a willingness to um, share the people that have been in counseling to, I guess, testify to the, if you will, for the, to the benefit of their own process and how it was helpful for them. Um, so that's something, like I said earlier, about just raising awareness in general in the public, and this campus is no different. That um, hey, this is this this is a this is a, a good choice, and um, it's been helpful for many people. Um, we it, one of the things we can't do ethically in counseling is promise the people we work with any. We can't promise that things are going to get better, but we can certainly give them hope that they can make some changes and do some things that will help. So. Um, so no, I guess kind of word of mouth, if you will, that we can, if we can get that started here in the in the DTS community, to hey, this is something we can do. And when you do hear about people that maybe have gone, if they've shared with you, to do what we can to encourage them um, to continue and, and not to in any way come across as being um, judgmental or to see them as weak or something like that. It takes strength, it takes courage to be willing to come and talk about stuff and to, to make an appointment and sit down with someone, whether it's a pastor or a counselor. Um, and so I'm, I, I really try to encourage that of people that I do meet with that it, it was, I know it was probably you thought about this a long time before you came in today and, and really try to encourage them because it, it really is a sign of strength. When I think as a pastor or someone in ministry, you carry a certain amount of authority that people ascribe to you and they will do exactly what you say. <clears throat> no matter what you say a lot of times. And so if you share about your willingness and your courage to go to counseling, 
that gives them freedom to know, okay, this is my pastor and yeah. I, they look like they have their stuff together. And if they need to go to counseling, then I bet I should go to counseling or at least they went. So it's okay for me to go. So thank you being willing to say, Hey, I've, I've done this and it's hard, but it was good. So what advice would you have for avoiding burnout when burnout is by nature unavoidable? Meaning in seminary, there will be times where there's a certain number of classes you have to take to maintain scholarships. And you have to work a certain number of hours <laughs> mm -hmm. in order to pay bills. Um, that's kind of a reality a lot of us navigate. So in those situations where self-care can cause more stress than it actually helps is say what are some tips and advice for just navigating seasons mm -hmm. um, in such a way that it honors God and avoiding burnout as much as is possible mm -hmm. well I think of self-care on a continuum and so there's things I do try to do on a daily basis just to kind of a little bit of a a little bit of deposit into my emotional bank account. And then there's things I do on a weekly basis and things I do on a month and so on. And I found that that, those just little bitty things tend to help so much. Because I think we think, especially in school, I always thought, well, I, if I could just do this for 16 weeks, I can sleep at the end of 16 weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which is not true, because at the end of 16 weeks, you just start right back over again, <laughs> especially if you're taking a lot of classes. And so doing little bitty things, and I think also, um, Brene Brown talks about a, a term called shadow comforts. Shadow comforts give the illusion that they actually are self-care tools, but they're actually not self-care tools. So for me, shadow comforts are eating and spending all of our money. So, <laughs> and so I know when I catch myself at the store, I'm trying to de-stress and I'm just making my life more stressful. And so paying attention to those things and trying to to engage in things, just little things like breathing for one minute that would be helpful. And then also know that I don't have to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So that means getting a B or sometimes a C, which yeah. hurts to say that. Even now, I'm not even a student anymore. And I was that just hurts. thinking, Dr. Bach asked earlier about the, you know, the, maybe the, one of the big things we see, and I mentioned you know, lack of boundaries and not saying no, um, but perfectionism. And there's a lot of claws at type A people. <laughs> uh, you, know, you want everyone to come out of the closet? <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's this, again, back, I don't want to harp on this again, but back to that motivation, maybe are we trying to be perfect? Are we trying to gain acceptance, approval, those kinds of things? And um, so, uh, so we can we can certainly do that. Yeah, we're not C's careful. get degrees. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look at us. <laughs> hey there. Uh, so as seminary students, or even as spouses, those who are engaged in uh, studying the word on a regular basis, a misconception that I've struggled with when it comes to Christian counseling is oftentimes the end point is going to be, we'll just pray more right. or have more faith in God. Right. And so uh, in the past, my thought process has been, well, I mean, I understand a lot of the concepts of scripture and I understand the faithfulness and all these things. So mm -hmm. I'll just continue to give myself self counsel like I would my parishioners. Yeah. Uh, maybe practically how would counseling play out differently than that? And mm -hmm. what are some dangers of continuing to think, well, I'll just self counsel. Hmm. Right. The idea of self counsel is a, is a dangerous idea because <laughs> um, it really does take someone else being there with us in different, different ways. But, um, you know, counseling provides us an opportunity, an environment, really a safe environment for us to really talk about things and get things out, so to speak, and have someone else there with us to help us do that. So we can't do that by, our, uh, by ourselves. So it isn't just a matter of just go home and pray about this. We really need to dig deeper. What's, what's really going on here? Um, and um, to help us, you know, counselors are trained to come up, you know, look at things like really trying to understand what is it, maybe what are your goals? What are your, what is it you're wanting to change? What is it you really need to address? And again, like we talked earlier that the counselor can provide this um, unique perspective that we don't see ourselves, And so we're not gonna get that in self-counseling. We need someone there with us. So we, we don't do that as licensed counselors. We don't just say, go home and pray about it. 
Um, and that is a misconception. You know, that we don't, not that we don't ever tell people to go home and pray, but that's not all we do. Um, so we need to do more than that, and we do. So self-counseling is kind of like being self-churched? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. It doesn't work either. <laughs> That's right. Hi. Um, I can say I definitely agree with the oftentimes medicines needed um, mm. things that have been said. I struggled with pers- postpartum anxiety. Mm. Yeah. And, dude, I mean, it just wasn't possible without mm-hmm. just some recalibration going on. Mm-hmm. So, um, that was for short term, of course, for three months or so after postpartum. But, um, what I've found internationally is that it is very much a cultural phenomenon, this depression and sort of um, being overwhelmed and burnout here in the States. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, we're not just in the States, in the West, in the Western world. It's a cultural phenomenon because in Asia or in Africa, um, it's not the, it, people are filled with so much issue. They have so many issues. Their lives are filled with so much stress and it's attributed to demonic activity. Um, their response to it is attributed to demonic activity. And I just wonder, as counselors, coming from a biblical, biblical standpoint, mm-hmm. do you address demonic activity like what we saw specifically with Saul in the Old Testament? I mean, you go down the line, he was very much afflicted. But now, if we go down the line, we would give him a pill. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm so grateful for the training I received here because this was very much addressed in a lot of the classes. And I remember one thing Dr. Dickens said is mental health is Satan's playground. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's kind of both and. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it can be really complicated to ferret out which is which. And sometimes it is a psychological issue and sometimes it might be demonic activity. I think part of it is, as a professional, knowing how to ferret those things out, knowing what lane to stay in and not, you know, venture out of your own lane. So it can it can be very complicated, for sure. Wouldn't the um, individualization that often is a part of the West uh, foster a a sense of isolation, which actually is unbiblical? Mm-hmm. Um, right. The idea that I function on my own is my own. I, I, I say the way the West is constructed with a lot of people, everyone's kind of their own little god. When you have a lot of little gods running around, you get a lot of collisions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, um, mm-hmm. and, and so, in that sense, to to think that you can manage everything completely on your own mm-hmm. is is actually you've, all you've done is set the table right. for trouble. Right. Mm-hmm. Couldn't agree more. I think that's so much of the problem. I think I was thinking the same thing about about our Western civilization, our mm-hmm. individualism, and uh, I think that plays a big part in in the problems that we see here. Mm-hmm. Um, I even like to one way to maybe flip things around is to recognize that we do have limitations, and we're we are not God, um, and we will be reminded of that as soon as we try to push <laughs> push the limits <laughs> test that yeah um so it's actually in a way there, there's a i guess a, a goodness if you will a reminder about who we are and who we are not when we try to push it too hard and so apathy um, is kind of the one of the ultimate consequences of burnout but even before we get there we can start to sense that things are not going well and maybe i'm this is not what I was not created. I'm not Superman or Superwoman. I'm, I was only created to do so much, and I'm trying to do more than I was created for. And um, that is not God's intention for me. And so. the other, the other element of this that is complicated is some pressure and some stress in life is actually good for you. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it, it's. Um, the, I often say another element of our culture is we have the sense of entitlement. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that entitlement comes with an expectation. I should have no pain in my life, right. you know, yeah. um, and uh, and that also is very, very. Dang- I mean, if you think about how much Scripture talks about the way in which testing and trial shapes us and mm-hmm. forms us and is good for us and exposes mm-hmm. us yeah. to our needs, it seems to me that's an important part of this package, if you will, about how mm-hmm. I view what's happening around me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I tend to cite Romans five often about the trials and tribulations of life and how, uh, and how you know, the benefits of those things and how those bring us closer to God and increase our faith. Um, so it is something that we, we all know, but when we're in the midst of it, we kind of forget sometimes. We have to re- be reminded that 
there's a purpose for the pain that we suffer. Okay, I think we have time for one more question over here. Do you see, if any, external pressures here at Dallas Theological that exacerbate the effects of one's internal problems? And kind of mentioned earlier with schools and grants that they only seem to exacerbate the effects. And if you see those, how do we as a whole, as a seminary as a whole, faculty, staff, students, uh, handle those well? Because mm -hmm. they're kind of just not going to go away. But how do we handle them? <laughs> right. Good, great question. That's a great question. Well, we are within the context of a culture here in the United States. And I think part of the Christian culture is we honor burnout and mm -hmm. scarcity. Yeah. We get on to people when they're like, no, I just, I, I can't do that. Or mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think part of it is giving people the freedom to not celebrate scarcity and burnout mm -hmm. and apathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, part of, as you alluded to, um, we all come into seminary with uh, with cracks, if you will, uh, in our foundation, and and the weight of the new stressors and the new um, things we're doing can expose those cracks. Um, that's why we have counseling services. That's why we have pastoral care here. We want to. It's inevitable. Some of those are going to happen, but we're preparing for ministry. We're, this is. It's not going to end when you graduate. You know, but this is a time to really address those things, and and there are there are services here in student life to help us with that. So, um, so yes, things will that maybe haven't really been exposed so much prior to seminary may come out in seminary. I don't know how many times I've heard that that I didn't have this problem until I got to seminary. And uh, you're maybe, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Usually it's or I had it, but it wasn't this big, or you know something like that. And so again, back to what we said before, there's a there's a, maybe a, a gratitude we should have that, okay, I'm aware of it now. This is something I need to, mm -hmm. to address. Well, Andy, Kelly, thank you for giving us your time for helping us think through this. <laughs> and I'm going to close this in a word of prayer. Father, we do recognize our need for you. Um, in the midst of life and its pressure, sometimes it's just the most important thing we can do to take a deep breath and to sense your presence with us, your care for us, your desire to guide us, to connect us to one another so that we can be mutually supportive and encourage one another. In some cases, just put an arm around one another. And our prayer is, is that we would be that kind of community that you by your spirit would so shape and mold us that we would, if there is need, come forward. And if there is need and we see someone, that we would step forward and be of an encouragement and a help to those around us. Help us to be more sensitive and more aware of our own need for, uh, for the support that we can gain from one another. Help us to be delivered from the tendency of thinking we can do it all on our own. We know that you have this given us the spirit within us because we can't do it all on our own. Help us to learn that lesson well and to turn to you and to those that you surround us with in such a way that we are encouraged and, and invigorated for the life that you call us to, the thrilling opportunity that we have to serve you well. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.